Nos vemos cuatro. Presentation. Hi, how are you? Juvenile, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you guys can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Just waiting for a few more minutes until the rest of the gang joins up. Hi, Tumurna. Who else is there? Ozzy. Hi. Happy New Year, everyone.
And Oluana said she was going to be late five more minutes. So uh, unless you guys want to get started, I know that we have some people watching on YouTube. So, Ozzy, what do you think? I think we should start because I have an emergency and I have to leave early. All right. Good enough. 705. Thank you. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Thank you, Chanel. Uh, I wanted you to uh, share screen the agenda tonight so that we all know uh, the presentation and, uh, of course, uh, reports from both the 33rd and the 34th precinct. Uh, just like to thank uh, the representative from On Point for being, being kind enough to come. Uh, I know that we've invited him uh, back in November, but you know, time is it's not ours, it's God, so uh, here we are. So we're going to make the best out of this uh, opportunity and learn from you as much as uh, we can, those of us who don't know your operation. So um, uh, what's your name? Couldn't quite get your name. Jason, right? Hello? Can you unmute yourself so that we can hear I'm you? Sorry, I was trying to. It wasn't working. Yes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Beltry. Jason. Jason. Nice meeting you, Jason. Likewise. Thank you. All right. The floor is all yours. Uh, we're going to open up with uh, telling us, you know, what you got, what your organization does, kind of work you guys do in the community, and uh, they're going to open up for q and if, if you have anything that you'd like for us to uh, share screen, uh, Chanel, you can make it up panelists so that hey, maybe you can play around with them. And if you don't know, send it to uh, our office. Uh, we can try our best. Yeah, I actually would like to share a, a screen if possible. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so uh, the name of our organization is On Point NYC. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization with about just over 100 staff. Um, we have uh, locations, physical locations in Washington Heights on 180th Street in Amsterdam and in East Harlem on, 100, uh, on East 126th Street between Park and Lexington. Um, at these locations, we have a, a variety of programs. Um, these programs range from our over, overdose prevention center, which I'll be talking about today. Um, but also we have, uh, a, you know, a food program that distributes three meals a day. We have an outreach and public safety department um, that is out in the community, um, cleaning up syringe litter, distributing Narcan, intervening in overdoses in the street, um, and redirecting uh, homelessness, trying to, trying to, uh, link people into care. Um, we have a, a, a care coordination department and program as well at both locations. Um, these programs are staffed with, case, staffed with case managers and patient navigators and testers that are conducting HIV, uh, free HIV testing, hep C testing, um, benefit navigation and linking people um, into housing and other care, uh, other forms of care. We also have a holistic program um, that offers acupuncture and acupressure, Reiki, uh, sound therapy, um, auricular protocol, and several other services as well. Um, both look, uh, we in our East Harlem location, we do have a, a clinic on site. Um, it is a Montefiore satellite clinic. We have a doctor and a nurse that work directly for On Point, and we have also a variety of, of uh, nurses that rotate from Monty um, and, uh, three times a week. So um, right now, the Washington Heights location does not have um, the staff or clinic, but we're working on hiring. Um, uh, we're working on hiring folks to, to build that program out as well. Physically, we have the space ready. Um, we just we're just looking for uh, clinicians to to, to operate the, the space as well. Um, and um, so let's see. We talked about our case management, outreach, and public safety. We talked about the the, sh the food program. We also have a laundry program and a shower program. Um, you know, in our Washington Heights location, we're open from 9 a.m. through 8 p.m. on Monday through Friday. 
And on the weekends, they're open from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. In East Harlem, the organization is open Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to, to 8 p.m. Um, right now, one of our goals is to go 24 hours so that we can have a greater impact and provide uh, more services. Um, uh, but, you know, that's an issue of, of funding and uh, staffing as well simultaneously. So something that we're trying to figure out how to handle. Um, um, but as far as me, my name is Jason. Like I said, I'm the Director of Community Initiatives and Impact at On Point NYC. Um, I run several of these programs that, that I talked about, um, primarily the outreach and public safety teams, um, our public safety hotline, and um, our external facing COVID work. So that's another ser another service that we have is, is that we do uh, vaccinations for community members. Um, that can That's something that's available on, um, on site, but it's also something that we've extended to our partners and other local organizations throughout Manhattan and the Bronx is to provide, is to come to um, your location uh, and provide vaccine services for your program participants or your residents or um, um, or your or your uh, clients and things like that. So um, the overdose prevention centers. This is a, a program that is new to the United States. Um, these are actually the first two in the country that were launched as of November thirtieth, uh, two thousand twenty-one. Um, we just we just passed our one year mark. Um, but this is something that is not new. To, it's not a new concept, right? Uh, these exist throughout the world. Um, there are actually uh, several um, international, there's actually over 120 safe consumption sites in, throughout the world. Um, give me one second. Uh, the first one of these opened in 1986. So there's been, um, you know, that that amount of, uh, that, that much years of, of research um, and data um, that, that, that proves that this is an effective method of, uh, combating the opioid crisis and, and helping people through their journey of addiction and into into wellness and, and, and sobriety. So this is an image of of one of the I believe this is Insight in, in Canada. This is an image of of their their location. Um, one, our Harlem location looks very similar to this, but it's a little bit different. And of course, the communities that we serve are very different. Um, so we had to cater ours uh, specifically to, to the people that we serve. Um, so, um, safe. So the point of the safe consumption sites, um, um, they, there's it's multifaceted, right? There's there's impact on on a variety of in a variety of levels. Um, first of all, um, it reduces the amount of discarded uh, syringe litter, um, and it, it's reducing the amount of of interactions between police and, and, and community members that are suffering from addiction, um, public disorder and drug use, right? If these, when these centers are open and, and in operation, um, this gives uh, someone or, or people that are homeless and suffering from addiction uh, a place to go. Um, so they can, um, and, and even though we we operate these safe consumption sites, like I said, there are the, there is the variety of other programs, including the drop-in center. Um, so um, people who come to our space um, while many of them do use the consumption room, others are, are there for the other programs that, that we offer as well. Um, so this also minimizes the spread of HIV and hepatitis. Um, and and is, is, this is actually specifically um, aimed at reducing the amount of deaths that we've experienced in the United States to overdose. I know that in 2020, we, ex we had over 109,000 overdose deaths. Um, and in the year in the in, in the year that we've been in operation at All Point NYC, we've actually intervened in over 700 to this day. Um, so this is uh, not only a, a public it is not only a social service, but it's also a, a, a public health intervention because like I mentioned, um, you give you're giving people who use who are who are consuming uh, using syringes, um, you're giving them clean supplies, then that's reducing the spread of HIV and hepatitis. <laughs> it's also reducing the amount of engagement um, that is happening with emergency services. Um, like I said, we've we've intervened in over 700 uh, overdoses in the year that we've been in operation, and these are all calls that are not being made to 911. These are all these are all instances in which we're handling it 
the overdose from start to finish and 911 doesn't have to get called that means no ambulance gets dispatched the er is is free right nypd does not have to report to the scene leaving all of them open and free to 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 deal with other more um you know other issues that that the communities are facing right so with all that said this is also actually um saving the city a lot of money um, I'm not sure if you guys know, but obviously, you know, with everything that I mentioned that comes with a 911 phone call for an overdose, this is this all comes out of taxpayer dollars as well, right? So that's um, to with these 700 overdoses overdoses that we've intervened in, we've actually saved the city over 20 million dollars. Again, this is money that can be used to be redirected into community programming, you know, rec centers, things like that, uh, re renovation, park renovations, whatever. Um, th um, this is this is a way that that we're saving money um and resources and, and time for our emergency response system so and this also increases access to medical care detox and and other forms of treatment right um while we are um while people do come and to the organization or to the the facility to to consume the it's it's really about the interactions that are happening between the staff and the and the program participants during that time that is really the the truly the the the, the special right our people are are uh, one of one of our other goals is to rehumanize and destigmatize the experience that the homeless person and the drug user are experiencing right a lot of people um that come to us this is the last stop for them right they've been kicked out of hospitals they've been kicked out of clinics um they have nowhere to stay so you know they're sleeping in the parks and and, and in train stations the subway stations and things like that so they come to us because we um are part of our harm reduction approach is to rehumanize that right so we're treating people with 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 tlc with with love and we're, we're addressing people by their names right or or by whatever however they want to be identified so um you know, for 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 us, that that's where the magic is, and that's where the rapport is built, and and that's how we're able to get re-engage people that that have been so um, badly or poorly stigmatized by 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 several of the systems that serve the the nation, right? Um, and re-engage them into that care. So, um, you know, we we make referrals to detox on a day to day basis. Um, we're referring people to either if we're not <clears throat> referring people to our internal clinics, um. You know, we're referring them to to other forms of treatment, and even the people that we do refer to our internal clinics. From there, if the need is greater than something than than, our, than what our capacity is, then we, you know, our our clinicians and our nurses and our navigators do a great job at referring our folks to other providers that that you know have the compassion and the care to to address someone who's suffering from 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 addiction. Um, so this is a, these are a little bit, uh, this is a little bit of the numbers that I was talking about. This is actually, um, for, uh, these numbers are from two months ago, I want to say. So all of these have, have increased um, significantly. Like I said, we're at over 700 overdose interventions. We're at over 2,000 um, participants uh, enrolled in the program. Um, and we're at over 50,000 unique visits. So again, in the year that we've been in operation, um, you know, and, and these numbers are specifically for the Overdose Prevention Center, not, you know, the the any of other programs that we have. This speaks to to the usage and the, and the impact that we're having in the in the community, because um, if they're not using in our OPC, where are they using, right? They're going to be using in the streets. They're going to be using in the subway stations. They're using in the parks in the playgrounds and on the schools. And while, yeah, sometimes we still see that um, because, you know, there are people that are resistant to care or there are people that are so deeply entrenched and have been so poorly uh, stigmatized and traumatized that they're, they're resistant to the care because of that. Um, so, but that's, again, that's part of the, the work that we do. Our outreach and public safety teams are out at six in the mornings, touching base with, with people who are sleeping in the subway stations and the schools to try and redirect them. Either we, we do sometimes joint outreach with other organizations who do case management or who provide emergency housing and things like that to get people linked to care directly on the spot like we're literally you know for us it's really 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 about minimizing the thresholds and the barriers that these people are facing to get into care and 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 bringing them a provider to them at their 
place of where wherever they stay at, whether it's under a bridge or in a park or at a subway station, and bringing them a provider that is like, here, I can get you into a bed by the end of the week. I can get you into a detox today. I can get you into, I can get you a hot meal and a shower and clothing today, right? So for us, we're, we try to address as many of the, their day-to-day -day survival needs as possible so that then we can worry about when they're here, they had that hot meal, they had they were able to use and, and self-medicate because they're in pain because they're, they've are they been sleeping on the ground for, for, for months or weeks. Um, and then they can worry about the core issues like like the homelessness, like, you know, getting getting it to a doctor and things like that, getting uh, mental health support and things like that. So this image on the right, that you'll see is our has waste tree. Um, and this is something, this is an event that I coordinated in Marcus Garvey Park in last June. Um, I did a similar event in Plaza de las Americas on 175th and Broadway um, in July. And it was a it was a, a care fair um, in which we basically um, showcase all of our programs. So our HIV programs and testers were out there. Uh, outreach and public safety team was here. Um, our, we had a vaccine tent open for people to come in and get vaccinated. Uh, you know, we had a litany, we had food, we had music, right? This was like, you know, us, you know, coming out and, and, and showing the community, look, we're here, we have resources available. We invited partners that they, they also came with resources. Um, and we, we, we want to be a, a staple in the community as well. Um, this has waste tree, it represents one week's worth of syringe litter or hazardous waste that was collected from the community. Um, you know, to, to this day, um, again, this is, uh, an older presentation. So this million units of hazardous waste is actually closer to 1.5 million, right? And this is just a visual of one week of hazardous waste. So imagine a month's worth of hazardous waste that my team has collected from parks and, 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 um, you know, school grounds and other things like that. Um, also in combination with, with hazardous waste that was collected from the OPC as well, though. <clears throat> Um, okay, so these this is a visual of our actual um, safe consumption site in East Harlem, um, our overdose prevention center. Here we have a uh, 15 opportunities for consumption. Um, this is again our more traditional model, um, like uh, the one in the initial picture that I showed you, but it's also our medical model. So this is co-located in a space that on the other side of this wall on the left of the bottom, um, actually on the, on the, literally on the other side of the wall on, on both pictures um, is, the, is the clinic. So our, our clinical staff is located 10 feet away from this space. Um, the staff that work in this space are trained by by the clinical staff up to the level of a nurse in overdose intervention. So this means they're they they know how to use Narcan, they know how to microdose it, um, they know how to set up an oxygen tank and break it down. They know how to administer nasal Narcan. They know how to they know CPR. They are uh, doing rescue breathing and compressions. They know how to operate the AED. So um, you know the the program, the overdose prevention program, is is opt in. Um, staff do have to identify that they want to work in that program, and then they will undergo oh, uh, a series of trainings and um, an orientation process to, to to get them into it. But um, like I said, this is our East Harlem model. Um, is 15 opportunities for consumption. Eight of those opportunities are the booths that you see there. They are stainless steel with the wooden divide and a large mirror with lights and a hazardous waste container. Um, you'll see on the, the plastic table in the, in the top photo that there are several different bins. These are all um, different supplies that we have available. Um, there are the clean syringes, clean glass pipes, band-aids, alcohol, um, antiseptic wipes, uh, gauze, you name it, tourniquets is all there. But all of that is used in that room and stays in that room. None of that is leaked out into the street. Um, we collect that and dispose of it appropriately. So um, again, the overdose prevention centers are for, for safer consumption of a different variety of substances. This includes um, heroin, crack, K2, methamphetamines, and cocaine, right? In Harlem, Historically speaking, that population is very is an older population of drug users. We have many um, um, veterans that are that are homeless um, that have not been 
able to get the care that they need um, and end up, you know, for one reason or another, homeless or, or using drugs. So, um, and again, historically speaking, this, this population in Harlem also is uh, higher crack, uh, more crack users and more K2 users. So the other seven opportunities for consumption are smoking rooms, right? We have one smoking vestibule that is, um, the, these two doors on the bottom have actually been converted and updated to, um, um, vacuum sealed doors with fiberglass so that we can see in and the rooms have been converted into a, a smoking room with a high powered HVAC system that um, you can have one person in there smoking crack, one person in there smoking K2 and the, the HVAC system is taking the air. So this is like a, a, a HVAC system that you would find in an industrial kitchen. Um, and literally there's no cross contamination. You can have two, diff two or three different people in there consuming different substances and it's just being sucked out of the air immediately. Um, and again, we're giving them clean supplies. This is again an, a public health intervention so that they're not spreading disease to each other. It's also a public safety issue so that they're not consuming in public, right? Um, and then you know, the conversations with the staff, um, the interventions that occur with the staff lead to um, a higher level of care than if, you know, you're trying to force someone to be abstinent or force someone into treatment and then release them back into the environment with no follow up plan, no discharge plan, and you're just making someone be sober for for an extended amount of time and then releasing them back into the to the environment that that put them there in the first place so um there has to be you know um in order for you know the treatment um aspect of it to be more successful there has to be a deeper level of, of coordination and care there um this next slide is going to show our uptown, our Washington Heights uh, model. Um, this is uh, this model is a lot more cost effective. This is our peer run model. Um, in this in this site, we do offer um, the the staff that run this site are more of lived experience. They, um, you know, people who have been formerly incarcerated or people who have a history of drug use um, tend tend to uh, work on this site. Um, um, and that's just by design. I mean, the goal really was uh, one of the goals were was to uh, launch two different models of overdose prevention centers, um, one with the, the higher budget, the medical model with the stainless steel. Um, and then, you know, this this peer run model, which you can see on the top left, there are um, plastic tables, the mirrors are a little smaller, the lights are the same, but the tables, although they're plastic, they're non porous So any substances that are being spilled on there, whether it's uh, blood or, or any, uh, you know, any variety of drug will not be absorbed. Um, and then, you know, we follow our protocol to clean every surface after after every use. Um, again, like I said, this is a, a lot more cost effective model. Um, any any um, any county or organization um, that has you know the capacity can can to, to launch one can can do this actually fairly easily. Um, one thing about the population that we serve in Washington Heights is that the the the, the users in the Heights are a lot younger. Um, you know, and there's a high volume of, of injectors that are speedballers. So again, people are using uh, different substances in combination with each other. So um, we we have to acknowledge that. And that's something that's reflected in our paperwork. These overdose prevention centers that we have, the ones in Harlem and in Washington Heights, they are um, programs. It's, it's not like a free for all like this. These are the only two rooms in both buildings that you can consume in. So every other room is is designed for something else. Like the drop in center is, is, a, is a place where you can come in and rest or get something to eat or wait for your case manager. Just like this is the room where you will consume at if you need to or want to. Um, um, the, the population in the Heights as well um, has a higher homeless rate, homelessness rate. Um, they're a lot younger and they're, they're experimenting more with their substances. So they also have a higher overdose um, uh, and high, a higher overdose rate. Um, there, are, there are also fewer registered users. Um, and to us, that's a direct reflection of the fact that the, the, they're they're more entrenched in in their homelessness. Like there's people that are more resistant to care because um, they're they're much deeper in their in their in their journey than than others may be. Um, we also have our our crash carts. Um, 
um, our, in our overdose prevention centers, which you'll see on the top left, right under our, our, our AED or defibrillators. These crash carts, again, have everything that we need to intervene in an overdose. Um, that includes Narcan, nasal and intramuscular. That includes um, oral airways and intranasal airways, pony masks, ambu bags, et cetera. Um, So right now, um, where we stand, uh, the overdose prevention centers are are privately funded. Um, on point, NYC does have several. Well, it's a night what we call ninety five five or ninety ten really, um, where the majority of our funding comes from city and state contracts. Those city and state contracts fund literally everything that we do except for the overdose prevention centers. The overdose prevention centers are funded through private. Uh, donation money, private foundation money, and fundraising that we do. So right now, um, you know, this this impact that we've had in the community, these 700 plus overdoses, these 50,000 utilizations, the 2 million units of hazardous waste would would uh, not be possible um, if we were not um, able to, to raise the money to operate these these uh, these these programs, um, and then everything else, like I said, from the outreach and public safety to the to the holistic program to the food program and and everything else um, is is funded through city and state dollars for you know public safety initiatives um, and 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 other things like that. So, with that being said. Um, long term, it's not it's not a sustainable thing, right? Um, for us to continue to fundraise the money and, and pay out of pocket for the service that is honestly a public health initiative. Um, so what we want or what we need at this point is, well, the first thing that we're trying to do is go 24 hours so that we can have a greater impact. I mean, for a year operating at a limited capacity, we've been able to have this these this type of, of significant uh, change in, in, in the community. Um, imagine what we could do if we went 24 hours. Imagine what we could do if we were able to open a detox in our own, in one of our spaces, right? We can... Um, co-locate that in, in, in the same spaces as, as we have the rest of our programs and, and our referrals and, and, our, and, and our treatment rate would probably go through the roof. But because it's not federally authorized, we have to continue to use our private money. So the, the attention then shifts to Governor Hochul, right? We, she should be lobbied for, for her to sign an executive order to authorize these across, across the state. What does that mean exactly? That means that Washington Heights and East Harlem will no longer be the only ones with this type of service, right? People wanna talk about fair share and equity, Lobbying the governor for federal for an executive order will bring that across the the state. Um, this will allow other the the, the Department of Health um, to to fund other organizations to do this in Brooklyn and in Queens and in the Bronx and in Staten Island and in Syracuse, New York, or Rock Rockland County or Westchester County. So um, the the goal here is really that we should be lobbying all of our elected officials and the governor to 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 pull for this executive order. Or, or for the, the Safe Consumption Act to be passed, which will then authorize it across the country. And, and that's... Uh... That, and that's exactly what I was just talking about now. Um, right now, it's um, um, it's not a pilot, right? It's an expansion. This the the pilot, um, like I said, this is this is a program that has existed internationally since 1986. So it's not a pilot in the U.S. Yes, we are the first two, but again, this is a service that has been needed, right? For the last 50 years, there has been a war on a war on drugs, but it's really been a war on drug users. So that hasn't worked. We haven't been able to arrest our way out of this, right? Um, we can't criminalize homelessness, right? So this is a more uh, a humane, a more compassionate and humane way to, to trying something new, right? These are our sons and daughters and, and family members out here, right? Um, our, these are our people in Washington Heights that are suffering. Right. So so why 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 continue to to do something that we've been doing for 50 years and it hasn't worked? Um, you know, it's time to try something else. So Safer Consumption Act, lobbying um for this to pass or for the governor to to pass an executive order. And that is my presentation. I thank you guys so much for your time and for your attention. Um I can open the the the, the format, the forum for questions now. If, that's possible.
Hi, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Jamarna. Good evening, Jason. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I pretty much want to start off by saying that I think that everyone in the community has seen these individuals all around the community, <clears throat> whether it's on the train, in the streets, we see them. And I think this is just a humane initiative and it's appropriate to welcome this community resource because I, I think it's not just about consuming drugs, but also helping people address their abuse um, and their challenges. But I pretty much have two questions relating to some of the things you do. Um, I, I saw in your presentation, you mentioned picking up syringes. And I think that's pretty prevalent here in the community. We see syringes in our train station. Do you think it would be possible that within your program to create a weekly initiative to clean up syringes in our one train station, station specifically 191st Street Tunnel? Because I, I think um, one of the things we've discussed here previously on this committee is the syringes, specifically 191st Street train station tunnel. So do you think it would be possible to have a weekly team um, collaborate with other community resources to address that on a weekly basis? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's a great question, Jermaine. Absolutely. So um, I agree with you 100%. Um, uh, it is very prevalent in the in the Washington Heights community. And um, the, the 191st Street Tunnel has been is firmly on my radar. I've um, met with uh, Council Member De La Rosa about it. I've met with the Congressman. I've met with the MTA about it. Um, and right now we do have a, a, a weekly initiative. Um, I do have staff that are going to the tunnel um, several times a week. But um, like, like I said in the beginning, we're a small nonprofit and I only have a team of six people in Washington Heights. So like they go there, like, at, you know, like they'll go there at nine in the morning or at like 7.30 or eight, like between seven and nine, they'll go. And, you know, we try to hit every station. So we'll go to 181st and we'll go to 181st and we'll try to hit the A train and the one train. But because the team is so small, it's like, you know, we can clean the, and we clean the platforms and then like people will just come and litter again. And like right after we leave. So like, we also trying to, you know, we also try to do um, service to schools and make sure that the schools are, are syringe litter free and things like that. So we're really just like racing back and forth all the time. Um, we, I met with, um, you know, the, 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 pre, the, the previously mentioned elected officials and the MTA commissioner, and we made a proposal to them about um, having like, a, a, like expanding, helping us expand the initiative, right, so that we can have more team, we can have more staff, um, and for, for a longer amount of time basically increase our presence in the subway stations especially in the winter time right in the summer in the in the summer and in the fall we could do we can increase our presence in the schools right but in the winter especially during the the, the rush hour commutes we wanted to have that impact um and and they uh the first thing they did was ping pong back and forth um responsibility and accountability for who who was supposed to clean the, the the tunnel who's supposed to clean the subway station who's supposed to do the trash cans and all that like i sat there and watched them say no that's you no that's me no we don't do that no they don't do that and in the meantime i'm like can we just have the money and we'll just do it at, like it doesn't matter who's supposed to do it like just fund us and we'll do it because while you guys figure it out the community is being impacted um and we and they never gave us an answer and we followed up repeatedly and they never gave us an answer so um if we could you know maybe uh, lobby the council member um to to circle back on that or lobby or or, or reach out to um the mta or 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 uh, sanitation to see if if you know there's a way we can work together because i definitely tried and we've been trying but um Right now, I'm only I only have the, the six guys to, to cover the entire Washington Heights, so it's a bit of a challenge, but I do agree, and it is firmly on my radar, and, you know, we do go there at least once every day, but, you know, clearly we need, it needs a lot more attention than that. Yeah, you're definitely understaffed. Um, so I also have another question. Um, I noticed I've, I've been in front of that space many times. I was wondering if you have the ability to decide um, or push an initiative to get that space painted. 
because it looks pretty abandoned in my opinion and I know in the heights and in where we have a lot of great artists and I know would be open to helping you paint that space on the ice on the outside would on point NYC be open to having community artists paint their space or put a message there that um supports the saving life initiative that you're pushing I I love that that is a great idea uh, I'm all for that um I'm gonna give you my email address so so you can email me and we can have a conversation on the side um but the one thing is that right now um, before there was a hardware store there and they, they, they didn't renew their lease. So we're working on, on expanding into that space where downstairs we can maybe do like a laundromat, something that that's going to be like a, a service for the community. Um, but we have to, you know, we're working out the, the rent, the, the rent situation and, you know, the, the terms of the, of the contract before we can agree to, to like paint, paint over those walls and stuff but it's in the works thank you if you may please um put your email in the q a um and lastly my last question is um i was wondering since we are public safety committee and we usually have conversations with our local precincts has your organization conducted any conversations with our local precincts on how your program can support them in shifting gears into addressing different 911 calls that are not relating to drug overdose. Because I, I heard you mention things about your services help reduce um, what 911 focuses on. So have you had any conversations with our precincts on pretty much um, helping, like making yourself available to, to I guess like 911 or our precincts to just, um, you know, just conversations around helping them address other things that are not related to drugs and just leaving that to you guys is um yeah. yes yes so we can think about addressing other crimes in the neighborhood yeah absolutely um so one thing that that we've done and it's been the biggest thing and it's one of the programs that i actually forgot to mention so thank you for the great question is our public safety hotline um, and that is something that was 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 born from our relationship with with NYPD, more specifically um, in the 25th precinct. But it, it was we were able to offer it to the three four. So basically, it was um, the public safety hotline is is uh, a program that we launched. Um, it's 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 staffed by uh, uh, the hotline coordinator. His name is Axel, um, and anyone who sees who observes. Uh, public drug use or syringe litter or maybe someone looking like they may be experiencing an overdose or even just someone who looks like in general like they're down bad and they need some you know some support um, you can call that number um, which is 718-415-3708 um, you can call that number and my coordinator will dispatch the the appropriate team to the location so for example I, I do meetings like this in you know uh, town halls in the heights, uh, community board meetings, the other committees, and I do the same thing in East Harlem and in the Bronx. So I distribute this number throughout, and then as people go calling, the the coordinator will dis dispatch the appropriate team. So this happens, you know, in in two separate Manhattan locations and communities, and in the Bronx as well. Um, so that is something that was born directly from that. It was like, okay, how can we get in touch with you? And instead of, you know, just like giving a manager's number or director's number, we created that position that can just field all those calls and then dispatch the staff to the appropriate location. Um, with that being said, um, I don't know if you know what happens when you call 911 or 311. Sometimes they never show up to the location. Sometimes they'll come the next day or whatever. So with that, we guarantee at least a response within four hours and, and also a, a lot more humane response than what it would be to, you know, in, in some instances with, with NYPD. You know, um, people have their trauma around it, so they get escalated quickly when NYPD arrives. At least when we arrive, um, it's like, hey, we have food or, 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 oh, my God, you're experiencing a medical emergency and they'll go directly into an intervention or, um, you know, just like, you know, trying to redirect in a friendly and compassionate way. So, yes, that public safety hotline um, was born from from conversations with the NYPD at the 2-5 that actually resulted in me doing several different presentations at the 3-4 with their roll call um, at 7 in the morning and at 3 p.m. Um, uh, from Assemblyman Taylor's office or maybe that's himself?
Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Hello. Hello, is that you, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, it's, yes, yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year, uh, Jason. Happy New Year. That was, good, how are that you? Was, I'm great, great. I, I just, um, I enjoyed every moment of it. Um, I, I would love to have a sit down with you. One, Jason. Um, two, how do we expand this? And I know over the 25th, 25th precinct, I see what's over there. And I also see what's on Lexington and up and down that corridor. So I, I really want to talk more to you about that. And also there are other places outside of the subway stations that there's uh, proliferation of these needles. And how can we bring other people along that can understand how to handle this? So perhaps there could be a component where you're training people um, community uh, stakeholders that want to be a part of it, but how do they do this? So I've got a thousand and one questions, but I want to blow up this space because more people are there. Um, Wendy, if you're listening, if you could drop our information and see how we can have a, a sit down expeditiously to figure out how we can bring funding. And I know I am a co-sponsor on uh, the consumption building, the assembly, yes. I think is uh, Thank you for the by uh, Rosenthal. No, you guys are doing the work and how can we do this and, and, and meet that happy medium? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I'm ghost. <laughs> yes, I, I would love to sit down with you as well, as well uh, Assembly Member Taylor. Um, I, I think there's there's a lot of different ways that that, that we can collaborate. Um, you know, we one of the things that we do is that we we Narcan train community members and other organizations. Um, there's another group in Washington Heights specifically called um, like Friends of J Hood Park. We've, we trained them on how to collect syringe litter safely. We also trained the Word Up bookstore on how to do syringe litter uh, collection safely. So um, I think it would be wonderful if we can train as many different groups in the community that um, are, are focused on public, uh, public safety. Um, and maybe, you know, we can get some joint outreach efforts together with with some other organizations that are doing, you know, deeper, deeper care, um, like, you know, services like housing support and case management. I know that um, through my work with assembly member Gibbs in Harlem, I was able to put together like a joint group of um, my outreach staff and um, case managers from the cases uh organization to go out together and um make those warm handoffs happen like in the field um, for a couple of hours a day so i think that'll be something that would be wonderful to bring to washington heights um it's something that i have done very loosely with cucs but i'd love to make it something more official um and it's just you know about um, you know, maybe we can put together like a task force for the heights or something like that, a public safety task force where, you know, all the groups that are concerned and want to contribute, we can get together because, you know, this is obviously a problem that's much bigger than any one of any one organization or one entity, right? So if we could get together and, and support each other through this, I think it'll be a, that much more impactful. Absolutely. Just one other question. Is, is there a component that you go into elementary schools and talk with kids? So on the preventive part, so oh, this absolutely. is what it was like. When you look at how young the folks are, whether they're 13, 12, and are there conversations on the daily diet? Again, I apologize for jumping in and jumping out. Uh, my chief of staff, Wendy Olivo, if she can get your info and we'll roll from there. Uh, and you'll hear from me in the next 48 hours. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank so you just, so much. Just, yes, of course, Assembly Member. Just really quickly, let me drop that info for your person to grab. Um, it's, okay, J good. it's Jason, J A S O N, at cornerproject.org. I know we're, we're called NYC, uh, On Point NYC, um, but I've been there for a couple of years, so my email is 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 of the corner project before the merger was complete. Um, but, I have a question uh, from Mary Anderson, one yes, of our just fellow board members. Um, before we jump into Mary, I just want to, about the schools for the assemblymen. Um, there is that preventative measure. I have I have done several presentations at schools um, for, for uh, high school children and um, for high school kids and and like uh, junior high, um, you know, on what to see if if they you know uh, witness someone or observe someone uh, using drugs or if they see uh, syringes on the ground. And we also have a great great relationship with the Wheel School on One Eighty Second Street. Um, and this is actually our second year that we hosted uh, an internship cohort for them, um, um, for students that were interested in going into the medical field in one way or another. So, um, you know, we were able to host uh, two students last year and three students this year. And I 
think um, next spring, uh, I think this upcoming semester, maybe in, in February or March, we might be getting another new cohort. So they get oriented on harm reduction. They do our bloodborne pathogens trainings. They do our safer sharps training and a, and a variety of other trainings that we put our staff through. Um, and, and, you know, we orient them in harm reduction and, and the prevented and other services that way. Th thank you, Assemblyman. Mary. Now, Mary. I don't have a question, but I can make a comment. Um, I've heard Jason's presentation before. This is not the first time. It's probably about the third time I've heard it. And uh, I applaud you and your work and your organization very much for doing what you do with so little staff to work with. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary. So, you know, I think that, you know, reaching out to community organizations um, to provide some backup or some assistance where, you know, we can, is an important thing. So I thank, thank you, you for I all your hard work. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Wendy Olivo. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year, and thank you for being here. Elia said, if it's possible, would it be... Um, would it be okay for the board to email the contact information for Jason, including his telephone number, so that we can arrange a meeting? And then also have a question for Jason. Um, you spoke about the different populations in East Harlem and in Washington Heights. And I was curious to know if the larger population that your organization attends to in Washington Heights is from the community or since we're so close to so many uh, venues to other states, I'm wondering if they're mostly from here or are they coming from other counties? Uh, predominantly the people that we serve are New York natives or, or, or are Washington Heights natives. Um, there is a, 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 a small, you know, there is there that group, you know, that comes from, you know, upstate New York or Westchester County or, or even New Jersey because the bridge is right there. Um, but predominantly our folks are from, from like Washington Heights and Harlem. Um, a lot of people that have become homeless, you know, through re rezoning or redlining and gentrification. Um, that's, that's primarily the, the, the population that we serve. And it's, it's, like sometimes it's people people find it hard to believe um they they you know they they talk about the honeypot theory that uh you know uh, um a program like this is going to attract drug users from from all over the state but the the reality of the situation is that people are not like if if you're an active heroin user or an active crack user who who you know has already their brain is all has already been re rewired right um and and is now has that chemical dependency and that physical dependency on the substance like that that person is not going to make it from like Brooklyn to the Heights or Brooklyn to Harlem just to use right there so um you know it's really it's really about the the people that that are there um and and then the the other part of the other piece is that people the people who do come right they're coming because of of the legality in their state like the, i know that some of the people that we that we see who come in from new jersey who who cross the bridge um right it's illegal to, to have syringes over there so um you know they come over they come to new york for it um and that's that 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 speaks to the the issue of of the policies you know state across states like um you know decriminalization is a, is an, is is another yeah. conversation but um that that yeah. would that would contribute to it more more so than the program existing in the place all right thank uh, you so much Jason of course thank you Wendy we'll make sure that you have all the 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 uh, the emails and and so forth a yes. uh, couple of questions Jason I don't know whether uh, some of the board members had their, had an opportunity to. One, uh, what was what is the criteria behind the the center selections? Uh, like, there's two centers, as I understand, one in East Harlem and one in Washington Heights, both um, as as pretty well known underserved communities. That's question number one. What's the criteria behind choosing those specific? part of the city. 
And the number two questions, uh, is there uh, a specific uh, protocol uh, for handling uh, several of the complaints that we receive in our office uh, pointing towards you know, the, the needles uh, found in front of 102nd in, in Wasworth, uh, in front of the school, Juan Pablo Duarte School, some in the, in the, in the tunnels in 190F uh, and, and so forth, in just several locations. What's the criteria behind uh, dealing with those issues? Uh, from from your from your center, I'll, I'll like to, to know. This. Well, I'll answer the second question first. Um, for for syringe litter, we can we can call the the number the public safety hotline. That's seven one eight four one five thirty seven zero eight. Um, and from there, they will the, you give the location of the syringe litter. Um, you can you know text the picture. The the number accepts text mes text messages as well. So you can text a picture of exactly where the, the syringe litter is um, and, and you know provide the pertinent information, the cross street, the location, the building, if there is one. And then my, my public safety hotline coordinator will dispatch a member of my outreach and public safety team to that location within four hours to, to collect the syringe litter. The only place right now that we can't really clean are the train, like we, we clean the subway platforms and the tunnel. The train tracks, um, MTA told us we, as part of our proposal to work with MTA and, 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 and alleviate the syringe litter issue on the tracks, um, we asked for permission to go down there and collect it and they, refu and they refused to give it to us. In addition to that, they said that there was a special um, track training that, we're, that, that you have to undergo in order to be able to walk on those tracks. And so we requested that training and they refused to give us that as well. So their solution was that um, every three or four months, a vacuum train will come and clean it. Um, again, our solution is a more immediate thing. We can come in and we can clean the, the tracks daily. We can also come in, right, with expanded staff. We can cover more train stations at the same time, more ground, more schools, right? Juan Pablo Duarte, uh, Wheels, St. Elizabeth's. We can be all, all of those places simultaneously if we have more staff. Um, but Funding is an issue um, and expanding too fast is, is difficult to do when um, you don't have the money to, to hire the right people. Um, and finding you know, the right people as well is, is also a bit of a challenge. So, um, you know, right now the only, the only issue and it's, I mean, the only solution is it would be to utilize the public safety hotline. Um, and the more that that hotline is utilized, the more we can justify its existence um to as a as a as a, a, a successful tool to combat syringe litter um and and you know until we get that approval from from the mta we're not allowed to touch the tracks i even suggested using an eight foot pick stick to to collect the the the, the litter from the platform on the tracks and they refuse that as well um so you know as far as the 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 the, the, the tracks go our our hands are kind of tied but um yeah, but you know, and, and especially with the winter here, we know that the homeless population migrates from the parks or wherever they stay at in the summertime to the subways because they're seeking shelter. Um, and so we try to, you know, prepare for that as best we can by being proactive and, and out doing outreach into the subways, uh, you know, before it starts getting cold and placing people and getting people housed before it gets cold. But, um, you know, it's it's a, such a small team that, you know, sometimes it, it appears um, that that it's not as impactful as we really are. And then the first part uh, that your first question is the criteria for selection of the sites. So Corner Project um, is a is a nonprofit that that was up in operation in Washington Heights since 2006. Um, Nairi was a, a nonprofit that was in Harlem since 1992. So the Department of Health, um, well, the first things first, a little bit of history between the organizations. Um, they were both harm reduction organizations that decided to merge in order to pool their resources um and 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 have have a greater pool of of you know funding and and staff and et cetera. So um both organizations were syringe service providers, again, which is a public health intervention, right? That's that's an initiative that was uh created by the Department of Health to combat HIV and Hep C um, and overdose. 
So both organizations have been um, the landscape and and. and I think he lost service. Froze. Jason, I think that you've answered as many questions that we could possibly come up with at this point in time. It's been extremely helpful. Your presentation is great. Uh, we're looking forward to have an even closer partnership. Uh, if the more information we have as a board and as a community, the better we are in a situation to mitigate a lot of the issues that you know may come up. So I think that um, is is a uh, is a good is a good move for us to close even together. Uh, there are hiccups in just in about anything that you do, but we expect this to be an even smoother ride if we can come up with different protocols that we can intersect uh, in what you guys do and what we do, which is pretty much to safeguard what the communities uh, needs and, and 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 complaints are. So thank you once again for responding to our call to come and make a presentation. Uh, I'm not gonna take more of your time. Move on to the presentations from the 33rd and the 34th. So we're gonna start from the th from Lieutenant Garcia. Hey, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Anybody hear me? Uh, I'm gonna start off by giving you guys the uh, breakdown for the last 28 days, which cover December 26th to January 1st. Um, for the 28 days, we had promoter zero versus zero, um, rape zero versus three, uh, robbery assault, we had 11 versus 13, uh, felony assault, we had 12 versus 17, burglary, we have five versus five, um, gun arson, we had 25 versus 35 last year, and GLA was gone out in the water, that's nine versus six. Um, obviously, we were down for the period. We have been down for the year as well, for the past year. Um, I'll give you a breakdown of the robberies. Out of those 11 robberies, um, four of them were with a uh, cutting instrument, four with an unknown, one with an alleged gun, one with a blind instrument, and one with a toy gun. Uh, the locations of these robberies happened three on happened in the street. Three were residential. Uh, one was in the department store, one in a fast food restaurant, one in a uh, public building, and another one was classified as other. For uh, felonious assault, we had uh, twelve. Seven of them were with physical force, four with other, and one with a blunt object. Uh, three of them were on the street. Six were residential, two were older, and uh, one was our grocery of the bodega. For uh, burglary, um, out of the five, it was two commercial. Uh, one it was in the truck, one was with residence, and one was in commercial on one time. Uh, two happened in public housing, uh, one in the chain store, one in the department store, and one in the street. For the grand larceny, uh, we had out of the 25, we have five unattended property, uh, eight identity death, eight for the person, and four for an auto. Uh, out of those locations, happened, 10 happened in the street, seven were uh, residential apartment, two in the hospital, two in the uh, mailbox outside, one was in the college university, uh, one in the fast food, one other, and then one in the train station. For the uh, Grand Lassen of Oro, uh, they had out of the nine, it was one Acura, one Ford, one Honda, one Hyundai, and a G. Four of those were left running and five were not running. And if you have any questions, I'm more than welcome to answer them. Hi, I have a question. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, so um, recently in my building, one of my neighbors got brutally attacked um, and they were very injured. They had to take them to the emergency room. It was pretty bad. Um, so I was wondering, I, I know my building is trying to push a initiative to push, um, request our landlord to push, 
cameras for these safety purposes. Is it possible for our precinct to support that initiative on on paper through this document we want to share to our landlord to pretty much have the support of our local precinct and um, requesting the landlord to put these these cameras? Well, um, we actually, we usually do that, the NCOs, which is the Neighborhood Coordination Officer, they usually go to uh, the building management or the super and suggest that, uh, you know, we could put cameras for more security. So that, that is something that, you know, we constantly do, other than uh, putting it on paper. I mean, I mean, yeah, we can probably put to management and and explain to them the benefits of having these cameras out there. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions for Lieutenant Garcia? I I I just wanted to address um Jumirna's concern. Um Jumirna, just make sure that when you put in, and you probably know this, but just to make it to to make it known that if if the building decides to do this, make sure that the cost doesn't come back to the tenants because landlords have a tendency of documenting these initiatives as capital improvement and they want to pass the bill as a rent increase. So I just wanted, you probably know this, but I just also wanted to put it out there that, you know, when it comes to safety and these kinds of initiatives, it's a non-negotiable, but the landlords will try to claim that it is a capital improvement and then raise the rent on tenants. Oh, wow. I was not aware of that. Thank you so much. Um, yes. And that, that's actually, it doesn't sound surprising at all. Um, specifically within my building, our, our landlord is, is, you know, sneaky in their ways. Um, so I appreciate you bringing me, uh, bring that to my attention, um, seriously. Um, and I, I'll see how we can go about about that as a collective. But I really, really appreciate that from the both of you. And maybe I could continue the conversation with the 33rd um, around that. But yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Lieutenant Garcia, question. What are how are you guys staff wise? How many detectives, police, or po police staff? Are you short? I mean, how many yeah. numbers? The, the whole city is currently on the staff. I mean, we are getting uh, new police officers. There's, we're actually getting five from the academy, uh, I believe, next week. And we got eight like two weeks ago from the officers that were. Uh, Graduated about three months ago, so we are we are getting some police officers, but we are still on this. That's that's a citywide problem, by the way. Yeah, are you are they going to be assigned to foot patrol or are they yes. going to be uh, foot patrol? Yeah, so right now we do have uh, about eight police officers on foot. Um, they go from one hundred and fifty five Street to one sixty Dar on Broadway. And that's what they are right now. But, you know, it could be subject to change. And we should be getting another five from the police academy coming up in the next two weeks or so. All right. Unless I don't see any more hands up. Oh, sorry. Thank I have you. another question. Go right ahead. I was wondering, since Eliezer mentioned uh, on their staff and, and uh, you know, supporting um, our officers, I was wondering... Is there, because I, I know that NYPD has an initiative of more officers in the train stations. Is there um, an initiative, any data that shows the improvement um, that that has created more officers in the train station um, around the fares? Pretty much has the more officers in the trains impacted um, people actually paying for getting on the train because from my observations I, I see we have officers on the train platform but people still don't pay the fare so is there has there been any data being collected on you know that the way they align with one another well that actually will be a question for the transit system uh, police officer but uh, I can tell you that, I can assure you that we actually, from the 3G prison, we're actually sending eight caps a day just for the transit system. And, you know, of course it's working. The, the more police presence, the, the better it gets. But um, I mean, they're not, as a, they're not paying the fare. I mean, it's always gonna be out there. We can minimize it, but, you know, we can try our best. 
don't know if that answers your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lieutenant. You're welcome. You had, a, you had a, an AC one today. <laughs> oh, this is not it. <laughs> Thank you. Just everyone. questions, <laughs> just questions. You better be asked, right? <laughs> um, from the 34th, who do we have from the 34th? We have no one from the 34? Nobody from the 34. Surprising. Okay, so we'll move on. Our dearly friend, Director Jocelyn Minaya. Hello. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year to all. Um, I actually do not have a report um, for tonight, um, other than, you know, we've been reflecting on uh, 2022 and everything that's been going on here at the district attorney's office during the last year. Um, you know, the office has been hard at work prosecuting gun crimes, as I reported in the last meeting. Hate crimes is also um, something that we're uh, focusing on uh, greatly. Um, you know, the high level investigations of white collar crimes and definitely trying to expand our community partnerships and investments um, to keep the city safe as best we can. So we're looking forward to 2023, to working um, with the community board and, and the, of course, public safety members um, and the community in general. Um, you know, we strive to continue to do the work that we do to deliver safety and fairness to all New Yorkers. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to it. We're hitting the ground running. So that's all that I have, unless someone has a question for me. Okay, uh, so I guess not having anyone from the 3-4 leaves a lot of unanswered questions, such as, is there anything new on the uh, incident that happened on Sunday on the, where the car crashed in the Inwood Bar and Grill? And uh, the video shows as though it was a failed uh, robbery, or well, robbery that went bad, uh, and a couple of homicides that has happened in, in, in in the three, four. So I guess uh, we'll save them for the next time. Um, do we have anyone from the FDNY? So Elias, if I can just um, just contribute a little bit to those things, even though of course I'm not the three, four. Um, both cases are actively under investigation um, within our office. There are assistant district attorneys assigned to both. Um, and as soon as I can bring um, any updates in terms of our end, um, I certainly will. And we have been in contact, by the way, with the family of, of uh, Ms. Um, Valeria Ortega, the, the woman who lost her life um, the day after Christmas and trying to support the family as best we can with counselors. I know that the precinct did an outstanding job with connecting them with the Office, office of Victim Services as well. So just so you know. Thank you. Um... Just having to hear the story of what she was doing on that morning is really captivating and horrifying at best. You know, it's just one of the stories that really touches every bone of humanity that you have. So uh, I'm actually in fear of being in a certain time, in a certain places, uh, something that I hadn't felt. And I'm sure that I share the same sentiment with a lot of you you know, being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So um, all we can do is pray that our police officers do the best they can, that they're understaffed. Your office, Jocelyn, you know, they've been proactive and um, just just, just take care of ourselves. Uh, that's that's the best that I can, I can say at this point. Uh, our committee is just like Amazon. It's just an informational uh, trampling in which we gather information and we shoot it back out. So, and we demand and we ask and we advocate. So I hope we continue to do the work. So having said that, unless anyone else have anything more important than what you said, I would like to call this meeting for an adjournment. Mirna, you're supposed to say. There was yeah. a question, sorry. <laughs> I said, 
if there's anyone else that would like to contribute or, or ask any questions, I would love to call this meeting for an adjournment unless someone doesn't feel like, doesn't feel so. I second it. Okay, so meeting adjourned. Hope you have a beautiful night and keep safe.